Good morning, everyone. Um, it's December 8th, and this is the uh, December 8th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. And Margaret, if you could text a couple of the people who aren't here yet, just as a reminder, that would be I'll great. I'll do that. <laughs> uh, seeing we have a quorum, I um, we will start the meeting. And my first task is to make sure everyone who are members can hear and be heard by us. So I will just call out the names as I see them on the screen and just indicate that everything is okay. Jonathan? Good morning. Doug? Yes, I'm in good shape, thank you. Roger? <laughs> good morning. Jennifer? Good morning. Paul? Present. Tammy? Good morning. Elisha? Present. Rupert? I'm here to report that everything is okay. Thank you. And I think, um, in terms of my screen, if if as others join us, I will um, make sure to welcome. So I think we're, we're good to go. And I just want to let people know, and then Margaret will be double checking, but we had a brief meeting with um, MSBA, that went around over the design, but just before that, we got the official budget that says yes, we got more money, and so it was nice to 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 see the the confirmed amount of the giant increase in the grant to the school, which really makes everything a lot more affordable for taxpayers. So, Margaret, I know you were just going to double check because I scanned it and it looked like basically your calculations, so we can. Um, uh, make that official. And Paul, I believe they said you'll get the official, official letter from them as well. So at first we got the very complicated spreadsheet. Yeah, I mean, I went to the bottom line. Um, I'm going to do, we're going to do a line by line comparison today just to make sure, but sure looks good. But yeah. it it comes in forms of a, a, re, a revised agreement. And they said, they just sent, gave us seven days to review the numbers before they finalized it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to Margaret, who will show we have a pretty. Um, uh, are we re Kathy, are we recording? I did hit recording. Okay, great. It's, it says recording up at top. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting really good at that. Um, but, not, <laughs> but, but thank you for checking. <laughs> so, Margaret, I believe um, we enabled you to share the screen, but if not. Um, I've got the agenda right here. Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to you know start as we've been starting looking at the overall schedule for the next few months. I'm um, going to give you an update on the MSBA comments on the design development. We also had a meeting with them yesterday. Uh, we can talk about briefly. Uh, we need to give you an update on the design subcommittee meeting that started to look at interior colors, updates on the permitting process update on the early site package. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we might approach notifying the abutters who are going to start getting notices about permitting. We're going to, Rick and Tim and Don are going to talk a little bit about the timeline for playground equipment, just so people are aware of it. As we discussed at the last meeting, we're going to have close the discussion on the uh, proposed use of port and place rubber on the playground, and we're gonna take a vote on that. We'll give you a little bit of a look forward about the pre-qualification committee. And then um, we I'm not gonna to touch on this, but I would like everybody to look at these dates. Um, we want to try to set the meetings for next year. What's changing a little bit about this is that we are now wanting to have these meeting once a month, tie these meetings to the monthly requisition process. So these meetings are hitting mid-month. We're not going to talk about that today. I just want you to see it on the agenda. And then we've got a couple of invoices to look at. So that is the agenda, which is packed. So. And I see Simone has joined us. Simone, can I just do it? And Allison, can you both, Allison, let us know what you can hear and be heard. Allison? She's muted. Yeah, you're muted, um, but she's nodding her head, so I think she can hear us. <laughs> I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Yeah, great. And Simone? Yes. 
So okay. it's just Phoebe, it's just Phoebe that's missing, correct? And an Angelica, I don't. Oh, and Angelica, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm gonna we're gonna start with the schedule update. Um, I mean, I hope this is helpful to you. It certainly helps me organizing myself. Um, the this is you know the hopefully now familiar format of looking at a kind of doing a what I would call a three month look ahead um, on the project. So here we are in this week. Week? No, we're in this week. So. Um, here's today's uh, committee meeting. We have a committee meeting on January 12th. And according to the schedule I proposed, we would have a meeting on February 16th, the following week is school vacation week. So um, let Kathy know if you cannot make that six, February 16th meeting. Um, what's the consultant team doing? They've been really busy. Um, we're submit, they are submitting the 60% construction document set to the estimators today. Ooh. And then we will have the estimates back just before the holidays. Um, in late January, um, we're going to be assembling the submission to the MSBA. And then the team is going to be focused on doing the final coordination of the early site package. Now I will say if, about this, if these estimates come back and for some reason we need to do value engineering, we may need to kind of rejigger this, but since these estimates are following close, closer together now, um, I sincerely hope that that's not, uh, not a requirement. So, Early site package. Now, again, this is the piece that Rick, just Rick and Tim described in some detail at the last meeting <clears throat> where we're going to be um, closing the south side of the site uh, to the school's use and um, the contractors, the early site contractor, which is, who's only focused on the sort of horizontal surfaces and prepping them for the building foundations is going to come in. We've had a really great uh, process coordinating the removal of the existing gas line and the installation of the temporary gas service over the holidays. And I will say um, the Berkshire gas people have just been absolutely phenomenal to work with. We're extremely grateful. And we think that that's going to happen for a, you know quite a, a reasonable cost um, at a time that isn't going to disrupt either school operations or the, the path of the project, shall we say, because that has to be out of the way for the site contractor to come in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later in the meeting about a butter notifications and what that's going to look like. Um, the bids for the early site package will be due in early February. I think we have a date for it, but I didn't record it here. And then the contract award for that would be um, approximately three weeks later. And then the, that contractor would be mobilizing on site in early March, which is the point, again, wh where the site sort of gets cut off from the school's use. Um, we have, as we talked about at the last meeting, there's a lot of permitting stuff going on. There's like multiple processes on top of each other. So um, we've had a kind of intake meeting, I would say with the planning board. And Tim, I think that applications are in now. The application for planning board, yes, the application is in and there will be some two others following for uh, design review board. And that meeting will actually happen before the planning review board. Right. So, and so yes, design, there are many. Yeah. Design re DRB is design review board. So there's design review meeting. At the same time, there's a conservation commission process, which is happening. Uh, that meeting is December 13th. Design review board is December 18th. The, we're going to be before the planning board for their first hearing, probably on January 3rd, not confirmed. And then there would be a follow-up meeting on the 17th. Hopefully they're able to close the meeting in that period of time. And then um, I'm gonna take this out. There actually is not a planning board approve, uh, appeal period. So, um, but we're sort of, the, 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 I just wanna say, give Denisco a big shout out because they're doing all this permitting stuff on top of trying to do, 
get the 60% construction document stuff out. So they've, those guys, these guys have been very busy. Um, in the meantime, there's ongoing coordination meetings with the, with departments in the town. And then um, yesterday, as far as the MSBA is concerned, we had our design review meeting um, yesterday, and then they're going to be reviewing the 60% construction documents, which they are receiving today. So any questions? That was a lot. <laughs> any questions about all of that before I take this down? I have, I have one, Margaret. It's, it's, uh, it was a request from um, a council level. Do we have, can we, when will we get a rough date on when the fences go up in the field? If people want to come to say, hooray, the, the project is starting. Um, so the protector. Oh, yeah. To have some sort of a. Yeah. To have some sort of. So I know that I, we can see it's the early site package and construction. So just a sense. And will we know that be that won't happen before J January 12th. So maybe we could no. just get, get a, a wording. So literally, it's like a hooray. Um, yeah. Event. Well, if, if people want something physical to celebrate, it's the fence going up. Right, yeah. and that I think will be Rick and Tim early March. Uh, mid uh, mid March, probably. Okay. Yeah. So mid it's sort of won't be from probably before yeah. March first, but it'll be right yeah. in that zone, Kathy. Yeah. So and I Margaret, think that's a great idea. Yeah. Or so yeah. Sometimes we've had like soft, um, kind of soft, uh, kind of ground breakings, Kathy. If that's what you're referring to, so. We could certainly do something um, and then have a yeah, bigger it, it, celebration it, or something once once we get the general contractor on board. You, you've given me an answer. I, I've waved my hands and I said, I've said the spring every time, but I've been asked twice. So I now have a, <laughs> a, a, a guesstimate that's a little less. You could say the, the first day of spring and you'd be pretty accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So any other questions before we move on to the next thing on this on this densely packed agenda? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So the next thing we're going to do is give you an update on uh, the MSBA comments. So again, the project's kind of moving fast. The MSBA is moving a little bit slower, but they're doing dealing with a lot more projects. So although we're submitting 60% CDs today, Yesterday, we had a meeting on the design development set, which was fine because they have some people transitions that are happening. So our project manager was transitioning out. There was someone new or a couple of new faces, actually. So really what it ended up, the meeting yesterday ended up being kind of an update for those folks and an opportunity for them to ask questions. Um, Donna, Tim, Rick, do you want to comment? sort of summarize anything about the MSBA comments? There wasn't no, very much. No, okay. no, I think it's, um, there were some slight misunderstandings, um, but no big deal. They kind of were asking for stuff sort of redundantly. They wanted a basis of design, but they also wanted this, the specification. So um, this is a new format, new checklist that they have. So. But, but there was nothing missing from our documents. There was just, we eliminated redundancy, but I, I guess they like it. So that's all we had to, <laughs> typical. So no, yeah. they, they, I mean, they were it's... very minor. There was nothing educationally, there was nothing that impacted scope or cost or, or anything. Yeah. And, for, um, and people, it is in the packet, both the questions they asked and then the, the, Denisco and answer responses if people want to see what that back and forth was like. Yeah, one thing I thought was interesting. Um, I mean, I agree with you, Donna. I think they have a way of breaking up their work internally for review that creates redundancy. So there's chunks of stuff that go to one person and chunks of stuff that go to someone else. And so you do end up with this redundancy. One thing I will say, and Tony Cunningham uh, brought this up at the last meeting, so I want to just sort of share this on the screen. Tony noticed, and we should have stated at the last meeting, 
that there was a difference between what had been in the schematic design schedule and what was in the design development schedule. So I'll just share, actually if I got the right thing here. Here we go. So just to close the loop on this and uh, good job, Tony, for catching this. Um, so this, can people see this? Yeah, little, yeah. little tiny schedule. Okay, so this column shows the dates that we had for milestones in schematic design. This column shows the design development dates. And what you will notice, and this is what Tony noticed, was that the um, mobilization of the construction start <clears throat> was late, a bit later, and she was asking whether there was gonna be a delay in occupancy. So I will say that part of the, Part of that change was us trying to respond to requirements the MSBA has for review periods. So we had to lengthen the review periods in the schedule. And we were able to clarify in the meeting yesterday that some of those review periods can be uh, shortened. So we're putting together now the 60% CD schedule. I just wanna reassure everybody that this is not, um, there's no change to the intention of uh, having building occupancy for the fall of 2026. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so the next piece is updates on the permitting process. Tim, I was thinking, Maybe you could um, give a little bit of the flavor of the conversation we've had with the permit coordinators and the different um, groups that we're meeting with and maybe explain their roles briefly. Sure, uh, we've had multiple conversations with Jennifer Mullins, the permit coordinator who seems to be able to connect us to everyone in town, which is great. Um, in addition to the meetings that we've had to make sure that our documents were complete for the design review board, which we sent in, sent in last week, um, excuse me, site plan review, which was sent in design review board is going in Monday. Um, we've also had meetings with a uh, fire department in the past week to make sure that the documents that we are submitting are consistent with, with, with what they want. And, um, you know, upon further review that we will be having with them during construction documents, we're meeting all their needs. Um, so, NOI is already in, in summary, uh, hearing on 13th, as we already talked about, and then there are a couple more submissions that uh, we will be meeting and hearing on in January. So, Tim, uh, on the CONCOM process, like you mentioned, the first hearing is the 13th uh, on Wednesday. I went on a site walk with our uh, civil Aaron. engineering with Aaron, a couple of uh, CONCOM committee members and our site design team uh, to walk the site and view the wetlands and answer questions. And the process is, is that Aaron uh, then posed some uh, technical questions to our site designers, which are answered. She includes them in a document today that goes to the uh, members so that there'll be a little pre-report that they will have seen before a very brief overview. We're given five minutes to present the, the uh, project from 30,000 feet uh, at the hearing. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, everything is uh, progressing nicely at, at this point. Uh, we would very much like to have the orders of conditions included in the bid documents for the early site package because that contractor will be responsible for maintaining the site uh, in the in the manner that the CONCOM wants uh, once uh, soil is broken. And we are on track for that, if not for, for the day that we're on the streets shortly thereafter as an uh, addenda. So everything on the com command seems to be progressing nicely at this point. Rick, so, can I ask a question? I should know this. Is the are the com, com meetings in person or on Zoom? 
There's Zoom. There's Zoom. Okay. Kathy, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to just um, confirm, Tim. It is the planning board meeting on the on the seventeenth, or or is it? It's on the third. We we requested it to be on the third. We did not request a date. We understand from Jennifer and Chris Preshrip that their um, agendas are somewhat full, and they told us that we may not be um, on the agenda for the first meeting after the application goes in. Um, we would like to do it as soon as possible, but they did not give us a date. Or well, what we... they said was their agenda for December 17th is full. Yes. The December agenda was full. So on the little schedule that I showed, I was showing their first the dates for their first two meetings in January, mm -hmm. which they said, subject to their review and comment, were the possible dates for us to go before them. And, okay. and they also like to have the submittal a month before the hearing date, uh, which left us out of the December timeframe. Okay, so we're we're looking at January. Yes. And probably the 17th, not the 3rd. Could be the 3rd. Okay. And you know, I, well, I think I think I think um the communication might not I guess maybe they're waiting to receive the packet or review the packet before they put us on the agenda. So um, yeah. I, I, we just want to, it, it, it probably is more likely the 17th then. Okay. Well, as I've said to Christine, you know, the sooner the better, because um, we have, you know, <coughs> we'll, we'll see what she comes back. She didn't come out one way or the other. When do you think the packet will be ready? <clears throat> The submission is in now. Okay. The planning board submission has been sent. Okay, good. Okay, anything else on that? Okay. So um, I'm gonna take one item out of sequence here, which is the butter issue, which was one item down on the agenda, just to sort of talk about um, that piece of this. So um, part of the planning board um, process will require butters within a certain, I don't know exactly the distance, but typically it's within a certain radius of the site, get notifications. However, um, as a sort of best practice, I think it's a good idea for especially when it's a municipal project for folks who are direct abutters who have property that abuts the property where the work is to get an earlier notice from, um, the, from the project. So sometimes in some situations we've sent it as the OPM, sometimes the town sends it, but it, it basically says this project is coming, you're gonna receive notice about it. We're gonna have a meeting just for immediate abutters to kind of give you some information. So I think that would be a good idea here as a kind of best practice and sort of being a good neighbor. Um, these are the properties um, that I would propose that we notify. So I have a draft of a letter um, that I've shared with Kathy. The other thing that we typically recommend as the best practice is to offer to the immediate abutters what's called a pre-construction survey, which they are not required to have, but they can, if they want to sort of put their hands up and say, yes, they can, we will, we will, as part of the project cost, have someone go in and document their property. Now, this is not a situation where we're expecting to be any property damage, um, but it, it does, for some people, um, it is sort of, you know, it's reassuring to know that they have a documentation of their property. It's a good practice for the town um, in terms of protecting the town. So um, I don't know that this is more than an update to all of you that we intend to do it. But if anybody has any comments on that, I would love to hear their thoughts. So I think town officials should be part of that meeting um, with the mm -hmm. neighbors for sure. Um, and what is the cost of doing all the pre-construction surveys? That seems like a pretty big, uh, why wouldn't we do that on request? 
we do you we only do it on request okay but what's, uh, a, but what's we, a typical cost for i mean well, again we, we're we, I'm, pay, I'm paying attention to the dollars here in terms of the yeah we just did this in holyoke for approximately an equivalent number of properties and it cost about sixty five hundred dollars for all the properties or each for all of the, for all of the properties. Oh, okay okay good. it's it's de minimis and it's you know it, it's good for everybody so yeah, okay okay i thought it was good question i should have mentioned yeah. that okay thank you <laughs> we would we have a, a typical partner that we work with it would be a reimbursable cost to our project mm -hmm. and we have sort of a bucket of money for that so if this seems like the right thing to do we would get a proposal from that company mm -hmm. um, and we would um sort of send out a letter relatively soon. I mostly want to get ahead of them mm -hmm. getting planning board notice yep. and that not having heard idea. anything else yeah. about a public project, right? Okay, so now I've lost track of what was next on the agenda, sorry. I managed to close my agenda file. I think the next item was and help. You've got the updates to the early site. Oh, package. the early site package. Thank you, Jonathan. So, um, Rick, Tim, anything else we want to bring up about the early site package process? Uh, we've been having multiple meetings with the school department and with Guilford to talk about on site traffic and getting cars off site. Uh, we've made some adjustments to temporary measures to help get uh, people on and off the site. Uh, the early site contractor will be required to do some uh, additional, some work on the school side of that north-south dividing line before they can divide the, or cut off the south entry point and change change the transportation uh, patterns so that early work will enable uh, parent and uh, new parent and uh, bus and van drop-offs. And then the fence will go up, finish the way across, and, and, and then the work can begin in earnest on the south. Uh, we we're probably about 90, 95% done with the uh, bid documents for the early site package. One thing that we still need to nail down is the form of contract, which we want to uh, include in the documents and Margaret, uh, get the electronic bidding process underway. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at uh, going out to bid as Margaret pointed out uh, at or after the first week in January, we're current. We were currently showing three weeks. This uh, contract has a design component for the uh, site uh, uh, for the rammed aggregate pier component, which means bidders will have to contract with somebody and do a a quick design to de determine the cost for that. So we may want to give the bidders an extra week and go four weeks so they can have their bids completed for that. So, so we can get good pricing on that. We'll start reaching out to people that we know Western Massachusetts site people to let them know that this is coming. Uh, there are some people that's actually done work out in Eastern Massachusetts or that are headquartered out there that are able to do the work and uh, we'll have a, tight package put together uh, by Christmas. So, Kathy, I see that Angelica has joined the meeting. Oh, welcome, Angelica. Can I just do a, make sure you can hear us and we can hear you? Yes, I can hear you. Thanks, Kathy. Oh, Thanks, Mar welcome. Thanks, Margaret. Okay, any questions about the early site package? Okay, so not part of the early site package, part of the building package is the selection, the process for selecting playground equipment and the timeline. 
So um, this is a this item is a little bit more of a discussion. So um, we need to figure out the sort of best approach to um, reviewing and selecting the playground equipment. And there's a little bit of complexity to it, but I think um, what Kathy was hoping Danisco could do was sort of talk about what's worked well um, for Danisco on other projects in terms of selecting playground equipment, who should be involved and how to approach this. Donna, Rick, Tim, does someone want to take the lead? And sure. About that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so every, obviously every community is different. Amherst is no exception to that, but um, typically just, just to be clear, the equipment is different than the full playground area, right? So, so the color of the surface, the, the patterns and the other activities that may be painted on the hard surface, et cetera, that's, that's independent of actually selecting the playground equipment. Um, what has worked well in the past is including a couple of community members that have experience in playground equipment or understanding of playground equipment. We would want school department staff, um, including the principals, uh, perhaps the OTPT person, even maybe Faye from uh, you know, special education, Angelica or others here that also have some experience or understanding of needs for an all-inclusive and universal access uh, equipment would also be helpful. But opening it up to more than say 10 people will will really um, become a difficult process to manage. And so we would, our goal would be, uh, we, we can talk about when all of this occurs, but if we could establish a subcommittee starting in January, that would give us plenty of time to have whatever it is that we need to have incorporated for um, the bid documents, say, no later than May. Kathy has your hand up. Um, yeah, at Margaret, you know, just mentioned this to me briefly, Donna, including a description of a possible process. So one of the things I thought, um, if, if if the process is you just was a working group, particularly of users, yeah. people, and then um, they could, they're working within a budget, correct? We have a- Yes, yes. Spend more, more than a certain amount. And then if there are options, if there's a discussion, it might be something we want to um, open it up, not to everyone sitting in the room together, but a mini forum just on here's the playground, you know, where we are on it. But after, so if other parents, not everyone in the room together, but an early insight. So I don't know whether the timeline would allow, you know, a collected group to meet, talk about what the options are. Or, you know, what kind of equipment there are, and then come up with some sort of tenant because there it's an advice to the to us as a committee, Correct. you know, yeah. advice. and then if there can just be one more step so that if it's, um, you know, a few pictures and stuff that we that we do something um, in the evening. So other people by Zoom, you know, so I'm not talking about a sure. Big, sure. Big. So I don't know. Yeah, what I don't know if the timeline would allow for that. And I don't know whether others on the committee like that idea. It was a way of, you know, not not excluding people from saying, did you think about this or did you think about that? Um, but it would be focused just on playground equipment was a thought. Yeah, I yeah. no, that's fine. Um, we will be working with uh, Bill Brown and um, Natalie Brown, our, our landscape architects, as well as working with uh, O'Brien, who is the playground equipment specialist. She did Jessica's, she also, or they, I should say, also, I believe, did the playground in town. I, I don't know why I have a hard time remembering the name of it, the Kendrick more Park. recent one. Yeah, okay. yeah, yep. Um, they're great. We can talk about procurement and all of that um, later. If 
um, as far as time and how we procure it. But it, we will have renderings. Well, first, you know, the, the whole process will be similar to how we've approached the whole building design. We'll have ideas. We'll show what is kind of new and out there that's great, that's all inclusive, that provides opportunities for all. Things really have progressed since Jessica's Boundless. And so we're really excited about the opportunities more than just ramps. I mean, there's equipment that's fully inclusive, not just ramps, right? Having the kids get to the top is great, but they're still not interacting. So, so there are all kinds of opportunities out there. We are working within a budget, no different than obviously the building project. So the, the process would follow very similar to, to this. And as long as if we want to allot time to have a community forum or community engagement, that just means we have to be diligent about having the meetings, making decisions and moving forward. Yeah, I, I see Jonathan's hand up. My idea was that the small group, the tennis group would be meeting and then the forum would be reacting rather than be- Yes, but, agreed, yeah. Jonathan. Yeah. I see Jonathan's hand is up. Yeah. So I, I certainly think that's a, what you described, Kathy, is a, is a good idea for a process. My question was really a bit more about understanding how the procurement happens, um, and and the ability to kind of get the the stuff that that people will like um, in in a competitive, uh, you know, uh, public bidding process. So Jonathan, the Equipment is every, every man, equipment manufacturer, are, um, they all have different equipment. So typically how it's done is we would, O'Brien seems to have the best equipment. Uh, we, we've worked really well with them. We've worked with others as well, but they seem they seem to really get the fully accessible and universal design. So it would be our recommendation to go with them. Um, with that said, that means that we either have to bid it as proprietary or we can take it out of the general contractor's um, bucket or control and O'Brien is on the state bid list so we can procure it through her with or them without having um, to put it out to bid. So there are two different ways of doing it and I don't know if we want to get into it now because it's a whole long conversation. I know our agenda is really full but there are methods so that we get what we want because every equipment manufacturer or whatever is totally different than that. So it, 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 it's not like picking a brick, or, right? It's, it's really yeah. specific to their equipment. And, and the timeline that Donna laid out is it the same for either procurement method. Uh, if it's not part of the general contract, we have to at least be able to tell the general contractor what's coming. So start in January, finish in May is a, is a, good yardstick. Um, Bob Parrott, do you want to chime in on this? I know you had an opinion about it that you expressed to me. Um, certainly, I would agree with the approach that Smith suggested first in terms of equipment selection, uh, you know, getting a group together to to provide input on that decision making and then going ahead and um, working with a single supplier, because I agree every piece of equipment is different and you really want to get what you want to get. So the way to do it is exactly as been described. Um, the key on any of this is if we're going to go off of the state bid list, and I know Simone's on this call as well, and she and I have talked about it, is we just need to make certain that what we are procuring through the state bid list is actually what Emmy O'Brien is approved to supply under the state bid list. And they're good, so I don't have any concerns about that. Um, and what I've done in the past is if you do that process, then you can actually provide the general contractor with the installation requirements, possibly as part of the bid package, depending on the timeline. So they know exactly what the town is going to buy. They know exactly what is going to be required to install what the town is, is going to buy. So there's no questions going forward.
Okay. Anything else on that? And so, so can I just ask, so if, if what we're saying is, um, you know, with Tammy, Allison, Doug, school, pulling together a group of 10 and Angelica, you know, if we have one or two people from our committee on it, but it's, I'll call it a working group because it's not, it's not literally a subcommittee of the 13 of us, but it's trying to make sure we're engaging similar to what Denisco did when we're talking about spaces and where, where the spaces went. You, you would want to know that that group has been formed by um, January 12th, which is the next time we meet is is that that would be awesome yeah yeah okay so i was just looking for uh you know people thinking about it between now and then and and having a and 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 then let uh, leaving the logistics to work with you all on how you know if those meetings need to be in the late afternoon or early evening you know whatever people's schedules are so but so so that, that that's all i was asking on uh trying to g get this uh, in place. Now kick started. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kathy. January still seems so far away, and it isn't. So, uh, we'll we'll also start working with Brown Sardina and Emmy O'Brien um, to get a schedule together, et cetera. And we've started the work already um, using Jessica's phone list as as a kind of base, and then working, you know, to what what you possibly could have. I. I think budget, just like with the construction costs, is real. And so the costs have also increased. So we just want to be mindful of that and uh, stay within the budget that's been established. I think it's $500,000. Any other questions on this? And then I think we're ready to move to the next topic. So actually, I realized, I apologize. I, um, I skipped over one item, which is sort of segues a little bit, which is the design subcommittee discussion. I went right past it on the agenda. So um, Don, let's see, Rick, Donna, you were not at the design subcommittee meeting, I think. So I'm gonna look to Tim and Rick just to summarize. Uh, we met with the design subcommittee and looked at sort of had one more look at exterior um, colors and finishes and mostly focused on interiors. So Tim, you wanna give a little bit of an update on that? I, I can give a little bit of an update and I would also invite Jonathan as the chair of the building to chime in but um yes we uh sort of are refining the exterior um there, there were no surprises there i hope a lot of what we did was show the um in real form the value engineering uh exercises that we did at the end of dd actually translated into the building uh, a few of the changes we made in terms of materials and glass were not drawn they were simply accepted as uh described um, and then we moved into the building to talk about how we would use color on different floors and in circulation paths in the building and the stairs and the lobby to identify spaces and, um, you know, you know the, apply a certain logic to the movement through the building, whether it would be applying color by floor, by project area, um, you know, whether all of the spaces would have their, their own colorway identity, um, and, and talk about what materials we were going to use. Um, and then we got some good feedback, but there's still quite a bit of work to do and we're going to schedule another meeting in January, hopefully to come back with some of the ideas that we've developed based on that discussion. Um, Tim, Tim, I don't know um, what Denisco, they came on site and we were, but we were also looking on screen and looking at materials. So I don't know with um, some of the color images you did, whether we want to post it with a, uh, in the packet with a big draft, you know, where, you know, it was evocative is what I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, stimulated ideas and thoughts rather than this was a final. So I'm not urging you to show it right now, but if anyone want, wanted to see some of the potential colors inside and how that changed by floor. 
So do you think that's too much? We didn't reach a decision. So I'm just looking for you on um, how to make some of that discussion accessible to everybody. Uh, we have the materials and we certainly uh, can share anything. Uh, all disqualifiers and uh, caveats, most certainly. Uh, but um, I will forward. Uh, I thought we gave some, but uh, we will give all. And we also give um, pictures of the materials. Um, so that should be a good balance too. It is extremely difficult to get a rendering that looks like a photograph or mm -hmm. in real life. Um, so hopefully that is understood in the process. And we, we do try to say that every time. Uh, but we will also include um, pictures of materials. Um, and I would add that the uh, site plan review and the design review board packages okay. that have a lot of the materials that we talk about uh, they also have photos. So, uh, you know, this difference between representation and what you're actually getting is very real. And we'll do our best to make that difference clear. So, Jonathan, you and Tammy, you were both at the meeting. I was just thinking that having people see not necessarily the video, but the, some of the pictures would be helpful as, as this moves along. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, so, so the next item was the discussion and vote on the use of port and place forever on the playground. So I wanna give a couple of updates to questions that were brought up <clears throat> at the last um, meeting. We had a good discussion, which was recorded in the meeting minutes. So first of all, um, I thought it would be useful and I did send a memo yesterday and it's in the packet. Um, Bob Parent had brought up something that I wasn't aware of, which was that the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, which is the state group, which promulgates state regulations for access and rules on um, any challenges, has developed um, a, a rewrite of their rules. They, their original rules, I think, date to 1996. So this is an update. It was drafted in 2018. It's never, it's not been approved by them, but I think it is important because it does, as I said in my memo, it does give the flavor of their opinion about this. So uh, again, this is not adopted. This is an intention. There's, if you if you go to the actual document, you can see there's like tons of things they're proposing to change about their own regulations. But the proposed changes here, which is, as it's highlighted, it would prohibit, if this were passed, um, it would prohibit the use of things like wood fiber, bark mulch, wood chips, shredded rubber. So we're not governed by this now for this project, but it does, I think, sort of give the flavor of their intention. Um, so a second question that was asked at the last meeting is what other architects and landscape architects are doing. So I, um, I, I talked to three landscape architects who work on schools. I also left a message for Carl Brown at the MSBA who just called me back several days later during this meeting. So I don't know what Carl has to say about it, but I can tell you what I heard from the others. So, um, I talked to, first of all, to uh, Tig and Bond, who um, you know are familiar to some of us, including Bob Parent. Um, they have a lot of different kind of um, consultancies under their umbrella, but one of them, they, they have uh, a landscape architect group that's been around for a long time, uh, was formerly known as Halverson, has done a lot of schools. So, um, the Halverson comment really came down to the accessibility and safety um, that it was they considered it a liability issue for communities to not go with port and place rubber and the accessibility issue and notwithstanding um, you know the concerns about that have been expressed about the what's kind of in the material that in the communities that they work with, those two items have dominated. Um, I also talked to um, Deb Myers, who is a landscape architect who has um, a firm in uh, the Boston area and does a lot of work. She 
basically confirmed those same things. I spoke with Berkshire Design Group um, who commented that um, they have seen communities struggle with maintaining the engineered wood fire fiber or wood mulch. And so mostly because of that, they the communities that they work with have gone to port in place rubber where they had to make this choice. And then, you know, of course, the recommendation here, the core recommendation is coming from Brown Sardina, who is this project's landscape architect. So if I do get anything back from the MSBA, who I literally, that's why the phone just ringing, um, I will let you know. But that was um, what I was able to do on that. Allison, you asked a question about documenting the risk. I think the best reference is the document that um, Maria Kapicki has mentioned and Kathy included in the meeting minutes. It's the UMass Lowell document that talks about um, the, the issues with that material. And we've heard those. Maria's done a really good job of summarizing that information in her comments in previous meetings. So with that, Kathy, do you feel, should do you wanna have another round of discussion about this here today? Well, I, I just want to hear if people have comments, but I think we need to reach closure and put this to a vote, which is why I put it on the uh, meeting as a vote. It is currently in the design package, and it is in, as Rick and um, Tim reminded us, we are going to CONCOM next week. It's, it's part of what they're looking at, and it does have um, permeability. So I, and then the other comment I wanted to make is as you design the playground equipment, you know, there's currently how much we need of this, that could change over time. I think we've got the maximum we need, you know, in terms of the PIP and it's been put into the cost estimates. So down the road, who knows exactly where that'll come out. But I see Allison's hand is up. So I did want to um, leave time for, to, get committee Allison's hand and Angelica's. So Allison. Yeah, I just, one of the things I also asked was about the uh, broken bones, because that was another piece of information that I was uh, worried about, but um, I didn't know if that was so, if we had any information on that, because that's what, something I am concerned about. I did not find specific information comparing the two. Um, so I can't respond to that question, although I believe there is there is information about them separately, but it's not coming from the same entity. So I'm a little bit concerned about comparing them since it's two different frames of reference. Um, you know, again, I think the 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 bit, one of the big differences between these two things is one of these is a stable material and one of them is not a stable material. So when you talk about having, for instance, bone breaks on uh, wood, uh, wood chips or an engineered wood fiber, you're not, the material can have migrated from the ideal condition. And therefore I think it, it makes it really hard to compare. So I apologize, Allison, I really wasn't able to find anything that answered that to my satisfaction for a public presentation. I see Doug has his hand up. But Angelica was had her oh, hand up. Sorry, first. Angelica, I apologize. Your hand um, needs to migrate somewhere out of that book. <laughs> I know. Um, so thanks, Kathy. And so I, the question I was um, asking is that one of the issues with porn in uh, place uh, that's been contentious is the amount of the toxins released and certainly as parents that have had kids playing in the playground it's also much hotter like in Groff Park we know we experienced that and I'm wondering if you had any information about what might mitigate that whether it's additional shading or anything that can mitigate basically the heat contact on porn you know porn place um you know Donna can weigh in on this but when I was looking I looked into that Angelica, and the strong recommendation is have it be an extremely light color and don't, you know, often, um, you know, there's one up here with an apartment building where to make it look like ground, they put lots of 
brown and black in it. <laughs> and that's not a good idea if you don't want it to get hot, you know, so that the, that you have a choice of, of the color and then the color re deflects the heat rather than absorbs it. So Donna, you can, and then. Yeah, the that was exactly what I was going to say. So, and, and the colors, um, there, there are so many, it's limitless. So we, we really can make it as natural as possible as light as possible, um, which is is great and fun, right? You also want it want it to be fun and inviting. So this is the north side of the building. So to what extent will the building itself in the winter time when the sun is low, it probably protects it a lot, but but probably not midday. I mean when probably it's not. It's okay. it's significantly far away from the building that it will not be in the building shadow. Okay. Doug, and then after Doug, Bob has a Aaron has a too. Um is it too early for a motion or do you want to have more discussion first? Because I would I'll I'll offer a motion if you're ready to have that. We can have you know continue discussion around that motion though, I guess. Um I'm I'm fine with you making a motion, and if we get it seconded, then Bob, we can also take your comment. Yeah. yeah so, as far as motion is concerned, uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll move to uh, to approve the port and place for playground as specified in the designs uh, currently. But I would like to second that motion. Did was that Rupert? Was that a second? That was Rupert seconding. Okay. Yes. Can I speak to it just a little bit? Yes. No, I think there's a, you know, uh, there's legitimate concerns about the materials of Port and Place, but I think when you sort of, you know, you're, you're making trade-offs between, you know, different kinds of, of, of difficulties and complications that come into play. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think the, in weighing those risks, I think the port in place offers us the the best overall package of of how to treat that section of of our our play space. Um, you know, but I fully recognize there's there's you know complications with that and and maintenance things we have to do and and ways we can uh, sort of actively manage uh, to mitigate those risks a little bit. So we'll, we'll you know as a school district we'll try to do that for sure and and keep that in mind. You know in in the fact that this is a year-round space for kids, not just during the school year. So, see, Angelica, I'm going to call on Rupert first since you spoke, and then I, I see your hand is up also. Rupert? Uh, thank you. I, um, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, the very real concerns folks have about environmental toxins. Rupert, I, we can't really hear you well. Can you speak up a little bit or un unmuffle? I, uh, I don't know. Does this work any better? It's a little better. Does this work any better? Yeah, it's a little better. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I, I don't know what's up with my um, my laptop. Anyway, um, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the you know the very real concerns about environmental toxins, and I wonder whether the project might consider evaluating uh, toxins in uh, the school site before we add the port in place so that we have a benchmark to see what kind of issues uh, emerge. So Rupert, you're saying to test the soil before the playground is installed in order to have a benchmark of whether the site develops contamination. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm suggesting, thank you. Okay, but, okay. And it, I guess, uh, Danisco, is that, I, I, I'm assuming we're, we're on some level doing that as we're putting, we're actually putting extra landfill in. We're doing a lot of work on the site before this playground goes in, but, but that could be part of that before the PIP is added. I like PIP as a name, but yeah, I'm seeing heads yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Angelica. Totally Thanks, and Kathy. No, I think uh, Doug is right that though we have some significant trade-offs and I think that that's why it's important to continue discussing about mitigating factors. I like Rupert's idea of having a baseline. I imagine that that also was happening. 
But I also um, wanted to raise an issue with, uh, I think, uh, Tim, you mentioned about um, if it's in midday that the shading of the school would not be pro enough to provide shading in the playground. Is there a way of mitigating it further with some kind of additional shading added? I know some playground structures have some of the, and I think Groff Park has as well, which there are like sails that are added so that um, in Groff Park, there's these like large sails where parents can wait when, especially when it's super hot um, and it provides some shading. Is there something that can be done, especially with, at midday when there's not going to be enough of a shade provided by the school or what, what are some ideas? Yeah, so I mean that we would incorporate shade structures as as part of the equipment. So you know, it would be just be part of the overall design. And we, and we, Sorry, we recognize that's an issue, Angelica. Yeah. So Jonathan, and then I also see Allison's hand is up. I just I'm curious to see if Rupert could comment. I mean, I in my head, I believe this the school district already has this uh at the preschool site at 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 um Crocker Farm. And if so, I, I I'm curious if Rupert would would feel comfortable kind of uh commenting on how it's held up and what the maintenance was like. You know, I I, I like others don't love this material, but I, I take seriously the 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 accessibility needs and and the other drivers that are tending to push in this direction. Yeah, Rupert, you can you can respond. Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, I haven't received complaints myself about uh, the the port in place portion of the pre K playground being too hot. Um, it's on the west side, so it does get an awful lot of afternoon sun. Uh, it is fairly light in color. Um, uh, in terms of maintenance, um, um, we have to treat it gingerly, um, and we do so. It's more labor intensive than, than the rest of our, our uh, grounds work. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of detail to add. I can certainly get some more information and, and report back if that's useful. Allison. I, I just, I want to make sure I'm not getting confused because the motion was to vote on uh, port in place in the current design. What is the current design? I just want to make sure I have it clear in my head. What is that? So Tim, I don't know whether you have a quick picture, but it's, it, it's, Give yeah. me one second and I'll pull up the site plan. You know, Bert, at um, a meeting earlier this summer, Allison, I'm trying to remember you were there or not, but we actually walked the area that would be the playground, you know, from the beginning of it to the end, sort of got a sense of both physically where it is <laughs> and and the uh, of this area that is not the other part of, I mean, there's vast grassy fields to be running in, but this we're talking about what goes under the playground equipment. The area in question is this kidney shaped area uh, north of the building. Uh, the area in the similar tone between the building and the playground is uh, outdoor launch hardscape play. Uh, the port in place potentially is, is this shape. So I just want to clarify. So somebody in a wheelchair could access all of that area that is in the kidney shape. Correct. E easily access. Any other and questions? Actually, Tim, what, what is the area of the port in place, Robert? 14,000 square feet. 14,000 square feet. Uh, so any other comments? If not, I will um, put it to a vote. So can I just comment, because I think Tony Cunningham made a comment at the last meeting that 
I I hadn't heard this number floated before that there was a rule of thumb of 75 square feet per student for a playground. And I think she was asking how many students might be on the playground at one time. So, you know, if we assume 200 as a number, um, and that no, if that number is a real number, that would be 15,000 square feet, which is actually a little more than that. I, I don't think we've actually talked about how many kids would be at, on the playground at what time, but I don't think 200 kids is an unusual number to be outside at the same time, and it's a little bit over. Tim, Rick, Donna, have you ever, does that 75 square feet per kid have any resonance with you? It seems sort of more. No, it doesn't. I, so, so, you know, every, depending on the age of the students, right, they may be the younger kids love to be on the equipment more than the older kids love to be out in the field and play Gaga pit, have the Gaga pit. So the, the age and activities that each, you know, grade may be interested in also varies, but it also depends on what the equipment is. So that that really plays an important uh, component of to how big the surface area needs to be. Uh, if you look at Jessica's Boundless Playground, it's it's quite large because it's a ton of ramps and and needs more space, right? But if we choose different equipment that might inform the size of the playground or the port, the pit area. So in some other communities, we've had a younger playground and an older playground. So then, so then that changes the area that we need. So I, I, if that's a rule of thumb, maybe that's for planning, but we've never looked at it that way. We've looked at what are the goals and um, aspects, features of the playground that the community wants? Uh, and this one's a little different because we're gonna make it an all-inclusive singular playground area instead of having two for the young kids and older kids. So um, that, that might be for planning purposes. That's super helpful, Donna, thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you, Kathy. I have uh, two questions. One is just about accessibility and the comparison to the to the PIP area as opposed to the other areas on the playground. So will those areas be less accessible or not accessible to students um, like in wheelchairs, for example? Um, and then my other question is about the motion. Um, if we were to vote on this now, does that prevent us from choosing or deciding that like we would want uh, like to explore a cork pip, a different kind of pip or um, the hybrid option for having the bonded EWF with the pip, would that would this motion prevent us from <laughs> making those decisions at another time? So let me let me comment on the, the process question. Um, Alicia, I think that the issue is, you know, you sort of heard earlier in the meeting how we are headed into the permitting process. So we've made submissions to uh, particularly con conservation commission with certain assumptions about permeability of material and the area of permeable materials. So um, could you change it later? You could, but the, the ramifications would be having to go back through the permitting process at a time when you are trying to go out to bid. And I don't think that would work. So I think we need to consider the vote today and there is a vote on the agenda as, as binding unless the building committee is prepared to um, pay additional costs to redesign and also to sort of throw a little bit of potentially a monkey wrench in the schedule. So repeat your first question because like, I'm, didn't I didn't hear them both fully. Your first question was full full accessibility. So full accessibility. Thank it, you. It, so it, Donna, Rick, Tim, you want to talk about that? The playground and the play surface around it, including the basketball, where you have marked play surfaces, they are all connected, level, and contiguously wheelchair accessible. 
as are all the paths and walkways shown. Um, thank you. I think so just maybe to specify a little bit, my question was more about like a compare, like I was looking for more of a comparison, like what is the difference in accessibility between the PIP and the rest of the structures? Um, and then in terms of the, the decision being binding. So for example, like we're saying now that we're going to choose the PIP surface, I wasn't exactly sure if it indicated in our current design, like what kind of PIP, like could we choose a cork PIP? with this decision or is there something specified in the current design that we would have to stick to? So I, I think I can answer the first question, um, which is the difference between these two. The, the playground is accessible and the sort of areas around this, this material is about safety in or is it, creating a resilient surface where there's a possibility of a fall. So you wouldn't put this everywhere if you were just walking on it. It's, 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 it's limited to the, the area where there might be swings or other kinds of climbing equipment. So Donna, Rick, Tim, I don't know about cork pip, but... Um... Uh, I'm not, I don't know what cork pip is either same but but you know i think ultimately the final amount or size of the pip surface will depend on the equipment that's decided on if there's a way to reduce it we can reduce it depending on the size of the equipment i think we're very comfortable with the size of the area that we're, we've identified, but if we can reduce it in any way, we'd be happy to, right? So um, I, I think that's another discussion point that comes up, but maybe to answer the other question, we're no, none of us are familiar with this cork um, and we really need to move forward on this. So this is what's been included in the cost estimates. This is what we all know. We've researched it, we understand it, everyone understands the benefits and, and potentially um, the, the negatives that come along with it as we've all been discussing. But to, to, re, to introduce another type of surface cork that we're very unfamiliar with is probably not on the table right now. Yeah, and Alicia, just to clarify about process. So the you know, from my perspective, the committee essentially approved the use of the port in place rubber as it was presented, I don't know, during schematic design, basically. What's the reason that we're talking about it here is there have been a number of public comments that raised this concern. And so we've delved into it. But at this point, from the design team's perspective, we're asking them to go backwards when they are trying to go forwards with the permitting and keep the project on schedule. So I see two more comments, Allison and then Roger, and then I think we should take a vote. Um, um, I, I think I had, I think I missed it, but um, even if you're going from a 75 square foot per, um, you know, that, that idea, uh, we would we would at any one time have a third of the school on the playground, and that would be the fourteen thousand square feet. So I, I didn't know if anybody said that, but I just want to make sure that was clear. Roger. Well, one of the things that I'm looking at and thinking about is the other group of ten who are going to take a look at the playground equipment that we have on. That's going to have um, the the port in place will be, I imagine, under the swings or under some kind of climbing apparatus. And what will lead, what will the materials be that lead the kids to that area? You know, they run onto the to the playground. That was that's my question. So, so the entire area, I, is that okay, Kathy, for me to respond? Oh, yeah. So so the whole playground area, Tim, is there a way even just pull up a photo of, let's just say, what do you have, Brightwood? 
No, I'm thinking just Brightwood even just just for people to fully understand, although it's it's different. So I don't want anyone uh, just so you can have a visual what we're One talking second. about. So the entire play area that we had shown um, a fully accessible uh, smooth transition. There's no you know differences in, in the levels or there's no tripping hazards. The hard play surface areas are um, like pavement that will be um, painted. And we also will need another committee or working group. We'd love to engage the students as well, Tammy mm -hmm. and Allison, mm -hmm. and, and um, maybe another working group to identify the lines and the games that we want to paint. Um, that surface also needs to be able to accommodate emergency vehicles that will also have access fully around the building too. So, so the combination of, and it's also going to support um, outdoor dining or eating lunch. That sounds very formal, outdoor dining for an elementary school. But um, so, so that would be for, uh, you know, outdoor eating, play, hard play areas, et cetera, that will be painted. Typically it's asphalt and then you typically paint over it, right? And then the port in place. So the transition would be smooth. It would be seamless. And then you would have the port and the PIP area for that would be underneath the apparatus to to prevent falls. Does that answer your question? If Tim can pull up a image, and when people, I don't want people to think, um, you know, blacktop because it's nothing. It's it's not. Tim, do you need me to pull something up? No, I I think. I think perhaps Donna, you know, we we don't have to, you know, we've got the other image, Roger. If that answered enough, you know, there's a, there's, and then there's grass outside of all of this. Um, but the the question is just the substance, and if people are comfortable, I'd like to move, go on to take a vote. I'm not seeing any objections. Right, so this is this is basically voting for what is already in the schematic design and in the cost estimates and is going and the basic landscaping. And Roger's correct that once the playground equipment is established, what goes underneath it will be fixed as well. Alicia. Uh, sorry, Kathy, I do have one other question, just trying to understand. So when we do pick the playground equipment, we're saying that there will be no or we don't think there will be any effect on the size of the port in place area, or that is subject to change once we choose the playground equipment, or are we saying like, this is the maximum we might reduce it? Um, I'll, I'll let Tim and Rick answer, but I think, you know, the amount of PIP will be, it's under the playground. So it may Correct. not be. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really, uh, we just, we we wanted to, uh, actually, we have started preliminary conversations with Emmy O'Brien just to get an idea based on, we started with Jessica's Boundless and then and then improved upon it based on what else is, has, is available um, to date. But to answer the question, yes, depending on the equipment and the outcome of this working group, this the area is probably going to change a little bit, right? Um, Kathy, if I could just quickly, quickly bring up, just I just want to show people for their benefit a, a, another um, playground. So so if everyone says, I, I really don't want to spend any more time on this, but here is a play area. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's some shade structures in the circular area that has poured in place. And then there's um, some other area, you see some swings and some other areas that's poured in place. And then all of it in the middle, the four square, the basketball, the, the map, the, the map, all of that's hard skate. So it, it, we try to integrate it. We try to uh, create an, a, you know, a overall theme and color patterns and everything else when, when we're doing this. So the, surface might be different but we think of that whole area holistically so if that if that helped you roger it helps a lot thank you okay thank you. 
So I'm going to put this to vote. And I will do it in the order of people on my screen because that's easier for me. Um, so <laughs> Jonathan, uh, Jonathan's hand is up. So just to just to ask you to to repeat the uh, motion. motion. Doug, Doug, would you read your motion again? Well, that would that would presume I had written it down. Um, <laughs> well, no, I just I, I moved to uh, to uh, uh, vote to approve the uh, port in place as in the designs currently. Hmm. And we will cap. Margaret will capture that in the minutes. So, Doug, you're now the first person on my screen. Okay. So I'm voting yes. Roger. Yes. Uh, Paul. Yes. Simone. Yes. Tammy. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Allison. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Alicia. Abstain. Rupert. Yes. And Kathy is a yes. So we have um, one abstention and uh, otherwise yeses with one and absent. One absent, right? One absent. So 11, 11 yes, one, but you can, I won't try to count on the yeah, screen. We got, we got. <clears throat> okay. So um, we have invoices, correct? We have invoices. We have approached a pre-qualification, but I, we can save that till January. So we're, let's keep going. Um, yeah, let's do invoices and then public comment. Second presenting my screen. All right, so the November package of invoices includes, yeah, is that big enough for everybody to see? So it oh. includes, it includes an invoice from industry advisory, a package of five invoices that make up Denisco's uh, November billing, and an invoice from Berkshire Gas that's already in the process of being paid in order to secure their services for the relocation of the gas line um, during the Christmas break. The uh, OPM invoice, so against a contract value of $2.7 million, this is a $41,918 invoice, less than 1% of a contract, uh, leaving $2.3 million left to pay as the project moves on through construction, et cetera. On the design services front against a $7 million contract, this is about a 5% progress billing of 365, 520 and 88 cents altogether for the five invoices, leaving a little over 4 million left to pay. And the Berkshire gas relocation was actually quite reasonable at $10,000. Um, I will flip to the invoices themselves and work walk through them. Um, this is the Denisco invoice. This is the primary one for 331,500. Um, this is the second progress payment for developing the construction documents. Um, summary report of where the billings fall in across all the Denisco invoices. Here's the one we just looked at. And here's a $2,200 invoice for on low backstop compliance, a $20,139.63 invoice for geotechnical services, a $3,181.75 invoice for additional survey services, and an $8,499.50 um, invoice for wetland permitting and monitoring services. Um, so presenting the backup to that, this is the 8,400 uh, wetlands with backup from the uh, consultant, sub-consultant and another one. A twenty thousand dollar geotech services with backup. The twenty two hundred on the low backstop compliance with backup. 
the 3,181.75 invoice for serving services with backup from the Berkshire Design Group. This is the Berkshire gas quote for or invoice for 10,188 for the gas line relocation and the answer invoice for OPM services. Do let me know if you want me to slow down or go back to any part of it as I'm going through this somewhat quickly. Um, we'll send back up from the um, uh, Net Zero consultant for peer review and another one of the same. And that's the end of a 39 page, page packet. Is there anything you'd like me to go back to? And then I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. I think, oh, raise my hand. Yep, go ahead, Paul. Uh, so, Margaret, I am assuming you recommend that these be paid, and with that, if, if you can confirm that. Margaret? Paul, yes. Okay, then I move. That for a minute there. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I move that we approve these invoices as presented. Second. Kathy, do you want me to call the roll? Uh, yeah, just for some reason, my screen flipped out. I can, I can call the road. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so okay. You turned into one person. So I will call the names as uh, I see them. Doug. Yes. Roger. Yes. Uh, Paul. Yes. Simone. Yes. Tammy. Uh, yes. Jennifer. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Allison. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Alicia. Yes. And Rupert. Yes. Thank you. So um, as I open it up to public comments, I want to make sure that everyone saw on this agenda, and if you need me to, I can send it again, is both the January meeting date and all the other proposed meeting dates. And if people can let me know if any of these cause a problem for them and otherwise, um, you know, just put a hold on your calendar. These, these are dates that the team has checked work for them with some of the other scheduling. But as always, we, we, can, we can be flexible if they somehow don't work. And all the meetings would be of the full committee would be at the regular 8.30 in the morning on Fridays, um, the way I'll, I'll go ahead and send out hold invites for those so that you can see them on your calendar. But yes, if you could, if there's if we have a situation where you don't have a quorum, it would be good to know that sooner rather than later. So, so are there any other comments before I open it to public comments? Then we are open for public comments. And I, I've been asked before to say how many people are in the audience. And there are one, two, three, four, five people, Rudy, Maria, Bruce, Maya Eden, and Tony Cunningham. And uh, I am going to uh, bring Rudy in. Rudy, I brought you in. Hi, can you? Uh, hi, Rudy Perkins, Terry Lane, Ambers. Um, can you hear me all right? Uh, yep. yep. Great, thank you. Um, just two comments. One is the the site work, the preliminary site work. I assume that doesn't include the geothermal wells, but I'm not positive about that. Um, and in all the webinars I attended when I was a project manager about uh, geothermal systems and in a conversation I had with a site manager of a net zero school, it seemed like the wells can sometimes be the problematic portion of a geothermal system, like um, problems in the installation. So I just assume if that's part of the packet that there will be particular diligence from uh, the OPM and the design team about throughout the installation process and that we're, you know, making sure they, the lines are kept clear during the installation, all that kind of stuff. They're, they're flush tested before before finalization, all that, um, so that we don't have problems down the line. I'm, I'm sure you're going to do that, but uh, I wasn't clear when that will happen. I won't, you know, I'm going to just trust that the committee and the design team 
are keeping an eye on that really important part of our energy system. And the second is that um, we keep seem, seeming to push back the discussion of fixtures and equipment, to a certain extent, the net zero checklist. And I appreciate the diligence on the playground equipment and a, a sort of a series of steps to make sure there's good input, the staff is, is, is involved and so forth. And I really feel like we need a similar kind of process for the fixtures and equipment, which will comprise maybe as much as a third of our energy use at the school. Um, I know I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but uh, I think it would be good to have more frequent sustainability committee meetings and or separate discussions of fixtures and equipment, um, especially any of the hard items like elevator, uh, walk-in freezer and stuff that might uh, affect dimensions in the building itself, um, doing that soon. And uh, then things like printers, refrigerators, all that uh, good stuff, uh, the video displays, the projectors, they're all going to use a ton of energy. And we should be thinking about the alternatives and how much old equipment is coming in from the other school, the existing Fort River School, and how that factors into our energy budget. So I, I hope we will you know, at least in January, start that uh, process of active discussion about those questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rudy. Maria. Thank you. Um, Maria Kapiki, South Amherst. I want to first agree that testing of soils, um, uh, thank you for suggesting that, Rupert, prior to uh, any installation, is critical. I want to also thank Angelica for suggesting shading, which I think is an important thing regardless of uh, uh, surfacing, but especially for any unnatural surfacing, which is known to create high temperatures. Second, um, I think that um, it would be wise to ask the CONCOM now to weigh in on different surfaces while they're doing this. I don't think that would be a huge ask to, to have them consider the use of EWF, bonded EWF and cork PIP. Um, I wanna let you know that I took a little field trip down to Springfield where all of their parks with playgrounds have uh, engineered wood fiber and several of them have the hybrid option that you had briefly entertained last time. Um, and um, these are structures that are not very old uh, within the past year or a couple of years. And the PIP is already showing signs of degradation. There are divots in it there. The, the material is degrading and being sent out into the environment. So um, another thing, the MAAB, the... Um, you referenced their statement, which says that loose fill surfaces and aggregate surfaces, including blah, 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 are not acceptable for accessible routes within the playground. That means that they can be used in other places in the playground. Again, consideration of a hybrid, hybrid option. Um, in addition, the unitary substances such as bonded EWF and cork PIP would be fine by their standards. Um, and as long as we're talking about future prohibitions, I want to refer to the other document in the packet by Eco Healthy Child Care. Um, in that, you'll note that California and Minneapolis and probably a lot of other states are considering banning the use of rubber PIP in playground surfaces. Um, along those same lines, there were a couple experts in this field who had expressed a willingness to testify and talk to you guys about this before you made your decision today. Uh, one from the National Center for Health um, Research and the other from TURI, from the Toxic Use Reduction Institute. Um, and I think it's a real shame that you weren't able to hear directly from them uh, uh, their opinions on this. Uh, along those same lines, please, I, I sent you guys, and I think somebody else sent you Turi's updated uh, report on playground surfaces where cork pip, which is a thing, was discussed. And, you know, I would encourage you to look at that. That at least avoids the toxins associated with rubber, which are 
numerous. Um, this is a really huge area and I appreciate any attempts to make any of these non-natural surfaces as small as possible. I mean, can we please consider other natural surfaces like grass between things? We are talking about having to have good accessibility and safety, but that does not mean that an area that is the size of three Oh, more than the size of three of the gymnasiums it, it, it all put together in this project should be this surface. And I will also remind you that in addition, as, you, as you've spoken about, in addition to this playground area, there's a whole ton of hardscape. There's basketball courts, there's half basketball courts, there's a whole bunch of hardscape all around the school. Could we please have some more natural uh, substances instead of the man-made. Um, that's it. I hope that you will reconsider this and explore options further and speak with experts. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Bruce, I brought you in. Uh, Bruce Coldham, uh, Pine Street. Uh oh, I'm sorry, I think I took you out. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you're in, you're back, Bruce. Okay. Did you hear what I said? I'm Bruce yeah. Golden, Pine Street. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I think that uh, I'm speaking to the, the appearance of the planning board and so forth. I know uh, I'm on the board, and I, on Wednesday, we were told to expect uh, the you to arrive on the uh, 17th. So uh, I'm basically confirming what uh, I think uh, uh, Donna was anticipating. Uh, if, if you need to go earlier than that, uh, I, you should uh, contact staff and see. I don't know that our agenda is that full, but then, of course, I might not know that. We took uh, two hearings to move through the Jones Library process. Um, that was pretty complicated. I assume this is going to be no less complicated, but uh, possibly no more either. So I think two hearings feels to me to be like a reasonable um, uh, goal. Um, uh, finally, I would say that uh, it's probably no surprise or news to you, but just to be sure, the I, I would anticipate that uh, traffic uh, uh, onto an impact uh, along uh, um, East Street would be the uh, one of the dominant interests of the board. Um, I, I've been a part of this process, as you know, for a very long time, and and I know that our uh, that this committee's uh, and, and this design team's uh, deliberations uh, were initially, anyway, largely by making comparisons between the likely impacts and trouble and so forth on the um, on the alternative site, and we were doing evaluative and comparative. Uh, assessments and so forth, the, the board, of course, the planning board will be um, uh, blind to uh, past uh, uh, comparative deliberations. So we'll be simply looking at the, uh, I anticipate, at the uh, impact as it, as it would be projected. So I, I would guess that that would be a very important issue. So I, I, I commend that uh, you come prepared for a fairly strenuous uh, um, um, invest, uh, uh, deliberation on that particular topic. Uh, but as uh, I say, I've come to understand and appreciate the diligence and comp competence of this uh, this group, so I, I, I don't expect uh, that there will be uh, confusion and so forth. Um, I look forward to um, being a part of a review body um, later in the year, early next year. Thank you for all that you do, everybody. That's it for me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bruce. And then the next person is Maya. Um, and let me, I don't know, I'm not sure how you pronounce your last name, Edon. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Can you hear me? Sorry, it's a little noisy here. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm just here as a representative of CPAC, and we wanted to follow up on some, um, on on uh, a request about making the new school um available for parents to have to sort of unobtrusively uh, observe their kids, um, which is something that is uh, required by Massachusetts law and is as presently is something that many parents have trouble doing. 
So one of the things that we've requested is that the school be set up in such a way that especially for the special ed classrooms, like the building blocks and aims um, and other ones that there are ways for caregivers, parents, and other teachers to sort of see what's happening in some of these classrooms. This can be done with, um, you know, special one-way mirrors. Uh, there are there are lots of sort of strategies that we can use. And I wanted to follow up about the possibility of doing this. Um, I know a couple emails have been sent out to all of you already about this, and we'd just love to follow up and hear what you think. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Um, and Doug may want to respond. We usually don't respond to public comments, but this did come up earlier in this whole process. So um, I'm going to call on Doug for a response for that. And then I'm not seeing any other hands. So, but Doug. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, uh, you know, we this came up a little bit last uh, at our last meeting. So uh, I kind of circled back to, to double check on some, uh, you know, uh, past work in this and 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 the current circumstances and and where we are and so one of the questions was around uh, you know sort of confirmation that it it would be something that would be considered uh, uh, needing uh, approval to do something of some of the ideas that are suggested like the the two way mirrors and and that sort of thing <clears throat> uh, those types of of observation materials would be ones that would require the union to to be uh, in you know, allow uh, would require the union to allow as part of the contract and negotiations. Um, I did have a meeting with the union recently, early last week. We talked about this topic a little bit. Um, uh, they confirmed their point of view that that they would not be uh, amenable to that kind of a change in in the working conditions. Um, so they would be against that. Um, that being said, you know, we do have ways to do observation. That's you know, they're absolutely correct. Observations are an allowed. Uh, and, and required component if, if asked for by, by parents. Uh, we try to accommodate that and we do accommodate that in, in different ways. And, and uh, in talking with, in, you know, internally with staff, we feel like we, we do a pretty good job to do that. Um, we did a, a little bit of checking as far as other places that, that have uh, those kinds of, of um, uh, like two-way mirror type observation circumstance. The the only one we were able to kind of identify was a was a preschool circumstance with what they call arena evaluation, which is where you know there's a number of adults, multiple adults that are trying to observe, and in that circumstance, because the kids are so young, they will do that kind of uh, an arrangement. But you know any of the other public schools we talked to, and any of the other um, you know facilities that we reached out to, were were not uh, don't have those types of 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 uh, you know, kind of devices or equipment. Um, so I think that, you know, for, for us as a district, we, we feel like we can meet the needs of, of parents around observation, certainly understand, you know, the concerns that are raised around it. Um, and, or, you know, and, and we'll work with, with families as, as, as uh, those requests for observation uh, come into place to see if we can do it well and how well we can do it with them. But I think it's, it's a difficult thing at, at this stage and where we are design wise, but also um, knowing how our union feels about it and, and how uh, uh, others feel about it, that it's, it's not a good direction for us to head at this point. Since um, Angelica, since this, this, I know you have raised this before um, and just so everyone knows, it's not in the cost estimates. It's not in the building design right now. Um, so the earlier answer was similar to what Doug just Gave, but the, there's been we can put this back on a you know what kind of arrangements, but I think that has been um, discussed and and uh, answered in the past. I didn't want to open it up as a whole topic, but I thought it would be good that I know Doug was doing some work to respond to you, you in fact raising it, and then we had a letter earlier. I think a hand is still up. Yep. Is I don't, I don't uh, Maya has raised her hand. So Maya, you know, we, we, we actually don't do a back and forth, um, but we will record your public comment. So I, Doug had asked to respond because he had done some work. So we'd be happy um, to address this further, but I'm not going to bring you back in because it was 
uh, Doug responded. So thank you. Yep. Paul has urged me not to break the, not to break the rule of of interacting and responding, but so I I, I did break it. Um, I just want to um, people can when we set the agenda. The agendas are usually set because Denisco and or answer has items they need to bring to us. So if people want to have an item on agenda, they should just email me and we can make it a topic for conversation. Um, so it's not it's not a closed agenda. It's just, it's been particularly driven right now by construction schedules and, and getting uh, the project ready to go. So any, any other final comments or requests? Um, I'm, I'm worried that we're gonna lose more people if we go much longer. Um, we've been trying to be pretty timely. We might have lost Paul. I, I'm not seeing Paul on the list right now. Yeah, we've lost Paul. We've lost Paul. So I uh, wanna- we're, we're also at the end of the agenda, so. And we're at the end of the agenda. So I, I just want to wish everyone happy holidays. Um, and uh, we will meet again in the new year. Uh, and uh, I um, look forward to continuing this. And just so people know, Denisco did say quickly, or Margaret said quickly, there will be other subcommittee meetings, including the sustainability committee meeting. We just need to schedule those at points where it makes sense in terms of the timelines. So uh, I expect we will get recommendations for timing on those. Um, and some of the items that have been raised are on future lists. So I wanna assure people that we keep pretty good records and the minutes that Margaret's been doing carry do carryovers of items that have not yet been addressed, which I think has been a very good practice. I don't see any other hands up, so I am going to say the meeting is adjourned at ten nineteen, and happy holidays and happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, hope everyone Thank gets you. some rest. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. All right.